Um, it's a huge honor, a great pleasure. Uh, we in the Irish Climate Science Forum are very much focused on identifying and disseminating objective climate science. Um, we are a very small group in Ireland. We are completely just self-funded. We have no vested interests and, and we focus really on identifying what is really the science and uh, trying to correct and educate the public and our politicians. Um, I thank you very much for this opportunity uh, since we met in Ireland uh, some months ago uh, to give a presentation to this group. Um, so here goes, uh, we'll run through it and uh, feel free to ask any questions or make any comments. I know uh, from experience that talking about climate science is a very touchy subject for some people and uh, they get uh, very excited about uh, differing viewpoints. So I hope that uh, we, at the very minimum, we can have a, an adult conversation if there are any points of difference and not come to, to virtual blows. So uh, in that spirit, I'll, I'll launch into my presentation. I have with me this afternoon, uh, evening our time here in Dublin, uh, four colleagues uh, with me in case they, they are obviously not familiar to your audience. They are Brian Sweeney, um, Ray Bates, uh, Tim Gleeson, and Donald O'Callaghan. And um, I'm sure they may wish to chip in at some stage uh, when we get into the Q&A. And uh, so here we go. Yeah, are we on the on, on the way to hell as, as Antonio Guterres of um, the UN Gen Secretary General seems to always say, and, and the newspapers keep telling us uh, it's all code red, uh, it's all a disaster. But is that really true? That's And that's what this lecture is about. Uh, to give a brief overview of my lecture, um, number one, I'll try to give a better understanding of climate change and, and what's going on, making sense of all the real world climate observations, uh, hearing the good news and the benefits of CO2, talking some home truths about energy transition and some comments on the net zero, I call illusion. And finally, to come to conclusions of, you know, we are in a, in a good climate, let's progress and prosper and as necessary adapt to whatever changes are occurring in the climate. The best way, way to start is to go back into history and to look at the paleoclimate. Um, our dear Earth is some four and a half billion years old and was indeed a snowball up to some 630 million years ago. And single cell life started about 3.8 billion years ago. We have actually very interesting information on both carbon dioxide levels and temperatures back going back from time now back to 630 million years ago. And that's derived from uh, um, ice cores and from sediments and ocean st uh, stalactites and st stalagmites. Um, and it shows fascinating trends that going back into time, uh, carbon dioxide levels varied and were sometimes even 15 or more times higher than they are actually now. And equally, temperatures varied quite widely from uh, around five degrees higher to five degrees lower. So, and the interesting thing is about all that, that there is not a direct relationship between CO2 and temperatures of the past. And looking at it in a slightly more correlated form, uh, here we have a graph uh, in blue of the temperatures and of CO2, the, the, the MOVE curve. And you can see that, for example, here in the uh, Paleozoic times, uh, the, the, there was an ice age with extremely high levels of CO2. So it, there is a disconnect. It, they are not connected. Other times, um, uh, temperature was much lower, CO2 was lower. And here in the time of the dinosaurs, they, 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 they met and, you know, extremely hot, differing times. But the overall trend which that graph tells is that there is no direct relation between CO2 and temperature. That's what the paleoclimate is telling us. And here we are now in, in modern times, uh, uh, CO2 way down at about 400 parts ppm compared to what it was at times 6,000, 15 times higher 
And here we have this little glitch now that everybody's so excited about going up to 400 parts per million or even more. So it's not at all exceptional. That's what the paleoclimate is telling us. Moving forward from the end of that graph in the last 450,000 years, there has been a remarkable trend of a uh, uh, very periodic um, climate uh, glacials followed by very cold periods, followed by quite short uh, warm periods. And these uh, interglacials come every 115 or 1,000 years approximately, quite regular cyclical. And um, here we are now in this benign warm period of climate where in many times of the past, most of the time of the past, it was far cooler, up to 10 degrees cooler. So rejoice that we are in this very benign climate here. And beware that in the future we, we're probably entering another ice age. This process is brought about what are called Milkanovich cycles, which are essentially caused by the rotation of the Earth around the sun and the inclination and so on of the Earth vis-a-vis -vis the sun and distance from the sun. So it's it's a very regular pattern over the four, last 450,000 periods. And looking at the corresponding um, CO2 levels, sorry, the, the, the blue is the temperature over those periods and the red is the uh, CO2. And amazingly, the CO2 changes follow the temperature changes. In other words, CO2 is not a driver. And th that again is remarkable, raising the question uh, of the modern climate theory, is it CO2 driven? Certainly the past is telling us, no, it's not. Very interestingly, the um, humans existed from about 150, maybe more, 200, 300,000 years ago. And they live in their primitive form through these ice ages. And, and that is remarkable in, in itself. Uh, our distant cousins, the Neanderthals, passed out uh, just before the current uh, warm period. So it's interesting that human humans, even in a primitive form, did survive those ice ages. Moving forward again, we're now in the last, uh, there occurred about uh, 20,000 years ago, we moved out of the ice age. There was a uh, cold, very cold period called the Younger Dryas about uh, 12,000 years ago. And in that time, Ireland was under a big sheet of ice, just as were uh, Canada, just was Canada. And then we moved into a warmer period, uh, not, not by any means even, and there were cold periods, but a, a lot of warm periods. And the, we moved into the Holocene over the last uh, 12,000 years. And there's a climate optimum, you can see in that period. And gradually, we're now moving into decline of, of the Holocene period. There were warm periods, the Minoan warm period, the Roman warm, warm period, and the medieval warm period. And we're now in this uh, war relatively warm period here. So um, it's, it's nothing new, these warm periods. We are, in fact, moving towards the end of the Holocene. Maybe in 5,000 years or so, we come to the next ice age. Yes, over that time, CO2 levels we're relatively modest, again, approaching, uh, going up to uh, currently around 280 parts per million uh, at the end of the Little Ice Age. So um, there's remarkable things have happened through history. You know, in this warm period here, we had the Neolithic and Egyptian tombs. We went from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age, a cool period uh, uh, pre the Roman warming, then the Roman warming. Uh, other cool periods, uh, medieval warming, mother, then the Little Ice Age, and so on. So it's remarkable that the climate changes, that na natural climate changes that have occurred over the, all that time. This is in a more pictorial way, moving out of the, the last ice age, um, then uh, warming and various warming and, and cooling periods uh, through. And, um, you know, the... Uh, Moving out of that period there, humans migrated out of Africa into Europe, 
and uh, across uh, the Americas and into Australia, New Zealand as well. So remarkable things have happened. And from this earlier time, we had the cave drawings in France. Agriculture advanced, economies grew. And indeed, the whole uh, Holocene has been a tremendously positive period for humanity. Looking at it a bit slightly more pictorial, in the medieval warming period, which was from about uh, 8, 850 AD to 1150, 1200 AD, was the time of the great construction of, of cathedrals in Europe. Um, and indeed the beginning of the Ottoman Empire and a whole lot of things that really testify to a warm climate those in those times. Afterwards came the Dark Ages, the Justinian plagues, where really population was drastically reduced. Then into the medieval warming period, uh, the Little Ice Age, you know, the pictures in the art galleries tell us what that was like. Extremely cold, um, frozen landscapes, and thereafter into the uh, the Black Death Plague and the famines of uh, 1800s and 1845 in Ireland, and then the uh, post-1850, um, the, the modern warming. So climate has varied tremendously over the recent uh, two millennia since uh, zero AD. Moving forward further, um, since 1850, the end of the Little Ice Age, um, temperatures have uh, increased up to about 1870, then, believe it or not, declined until about 1915, warmed from 1915 to 1945, actually cooled from 1945 to 1978. And there are big concerns at that time about global cooling. Uh, and I can even remember that. And thereafter, the warming began again. So by all of that is not uh, consistent with um, CO2 being the total explanation. There are clearly other factors happening that are uh, besides CO2, which is affecting climate, some cooling, some warming. And another interesting fact, we're all IPCC tell us that the rate of warming is unprecedented in recent times. That is not true. It was just as strong from 1915 to 45 and just as strong and rapid as it was in the uh, interglacials I, I showed on the previous slides. Um, the uh, Another very interesting factor is that uh, the graph here shows that land temperatures, the red, are cons are warmer now than the sea temperatures, the blue uh, and the dark blue being the composite of both. So it's, it's just showing that there are questions about databases and it's not all that simple. Moving forward further again, uh, now in the era, the satellite era for temperature measurement, we have very good satellite uh, measurements of temperate global temperature uh, since 1979. And the remarkable thing that this is showing is that there is a pulsing effect. There are natural variations at play every couple of years, these cycles up and down. And that comes from the El Nino and La Nina effect. They're completely natural um, uh, warming of the uh, Pacific Ocean and driving temperatures up and down. Uh, the El Nino pushing them up, La Nina pushing them down. And some quite high peaks uh, in 1998 and, and 2015, notably. Um, but in all of that, yes, there is a gradual warming trend, about a half a degree over that time. Uh, but it's not uh, it's not that regular. Uh, there is perhaps a, a flat period here, another flat period here. And we are now, believe it or not, in a pause over the last almost nine years. So it, it again is raising questions. Is CO2 the driver? There certainly and very clearly are other factors at play. The very interesting thing is that overall from this graph, the, um, the trend is about a warming of about 0.13 degrees centigrade per decade. And that, if you take 80 years going forward, would give you about one degree more uh, uh, higher temperature between now and uh, 2100. Is that of any crisis? I don't think so. It's something that we can live with. Um, we are still actually coming out of the Little Ice Age, where temperatures were extremely low, one of the lowest 
periods in in the last two thousand years. Um, so it's it's really educating to examine in depth what is happening on global temperatures, and the satellite temperatures are much more uh, um, reliable because they cover the entire globe um, very systematically, whereas the other temperature land based de temperature data sets are subject to um, the urban heat island effect. They're not accurate. Uh, there have been several um, corrections and adjustments that make them less reliable. And equally, the sea-based temperatures are not that reliable. So the satellite temperature database provides a very clear picture of what is happening in modern times. So what's really happening? I mean, this picture is taken from a recent IPCC report. Clearly, the sun is shining, bringing in heat. Some is reflected from clouds, some from the earth itself. And, and uh, you know, there's then some of that heat goes back. Some is reflected from clouds. There's the greenhouse effect reflecting heat back or uh, providing uh, enclosure, if you like, of that heat and keeping it within the system. Some goes back into space. So there are all the, it's a pretty complex picture of what is happening. What do IPCC tell us? Oh, uh, they, they, they say this is the what we call the infamous hockey stick, where they um, produce from the year, uh, the last 2000 years. Uh, in their view, there's been almost no uh, temperature variations over the last 2000 years. They have blotted out the Little Ice Age, the medieval warming, the Roman warming. Um, and, you know, that is very, very questionable. And they say, here we are now in, in what they view as, as a totally unprecedented warming. Um, that is not true. It's simply, it's been proven that this um, uh, hockey stick is in fact invalid. It's, it simply is patched together from disparate data and the, all the records that uh, I have shown in the previous slides point to considerable variations in warming and cooling over the last 2000 years. This is the IPCC view of what is causing, uh, as they see, uh, the changes in climate. They point it all to CO2 and other natural variability they put at causing uh, no overall effect. So that's the IPCC view of things. Certainly the facts do not agree with their analysis. Uh, their analysis they, they have done, they developed climate models uh, both in the uh, their fifth assessment report of the year 2013 and their sixth assessment report, uh, the the physical technical one was uh, issued in 2021, and they they have developed various scenarios. Um, the, the highest being they what they call the RCP 8.5, which envisages uh, emissions by the year 2100 being two and a half times what they are now which is, is, is quite ridiculous, it's just implausible. Yet, um, that is, it has been regarded by many as the business as usual, but certainly is not the case. They have other scenarios of modest growth and scenarios of severe mitigation. And in all of these, they come with projections for temperature up to 2100, their highest case showing um, about four degrees or in the upper Quartile, 95th percent, uh, percentile of that, possibly up to 4.7 degrees warming. And equally in sea level rise, they project uh, what could be up to one meter sea level rise. And of course, the media jump on these highest figures as being what IPCC is saying and all its, its uh, disaster coming down the road. But that that is simply taking a completely exaggerated view of what IPCC is saying. What does the uh, real evidence tell us? This work has been done by um, uh, um, Roy Spencer and John, and John um, uh, in a, of the University of Alabama, uh, where they have compared the models uh, uh, that are produced by IPCC and compared them with the actual observations, John Christie and, and Roy Spencer. Uh, mm -hmm. They have compared them with these satellite data measurements, and you can see that the slope, the the red line, is the average of all the IPCC models in AR5, and the the green is the 
actually observed. So you can see there's a huge disparity, but the real world is saying the models are overheated. And uh, that is a reality check, uh, which IPCC simply has not taken into account. Similarly, in their most recent report, the, the AR6 report, the sixth assessment, they again, the models show uh, very strong uh, heating going forward. All these squiggly lines re uh, refer to the various different models, but yet the reality observations uh, based particularly on um, the satellite temperature bases, plus, plus balloon records and other observations tell us that the rate of warming is much slower, about half what uh, IPCC has predicted. So it's amazing that uh, IPCC, even since AR5 in the last five years, did not recognize that their models are overheated and produce more accurate versions in the AR6 report. Moving a little bit into the physics, and, and this is, uh, I'll try to explain as best I can. Um, this is the spectrum of um, radiation coming in from the sun. This is the red, the visible sunlight, and uh, this is the infrared, the outgoing uh, reflected from Earth. And, you know, this outgoing, if you like, is, is uh, determined, the amount outgoing is determined and, and slowed by the greenhouse gases, of which the principal one is water vapor. Then there's carbon dioxide and methane. And these are the, the absorbing the outgoing radiation. And that is the, the greenhouse uh, gas effect. And um, that is, is really the, the depth, that is the physics uh, of uh, what this climate change is about. Uh, there's a lot of fairly complicated explanations of why that is so. Um, but, you know, the, in trying to keep it simple, that is the basic physics, if you like. And looking at it, this, the outgoing in more detail, the blue curve would represent the situation where they're absolutely a, a completely transparent atmosphere. However, the various greenhouse gases do uh, constrain a lot of this outgoing radiation. And this one, this particular curve is for, for carbon dioxide. And you can see, and this work has been done by um, uh, Bill, Will Happer and William Van Weingarten, the, the leading physicists, and they have done analysis showing that the, um, yes, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It does constrain uh, uh, zero. Uh, it does constrain the uh, reflection of heat through the atmosphere. And remarkably, their work shows that, uh, yes, CO2 is a potent greenhouse gas and does uh, actually, if there was no CO2, we would be in, in a much colder Earth. Uh, the, the temperature would be far lower than current and we would be back in a snowball situation. So thankfully, CO2 actually keeps the Earth warm, keeps it habitable. But as you can see in these other, as the CO2 concentrations go up, there is less and less impact. In other words, there is a logarithmically decreasing uh, a greenhouse effect of increasing CO2 levels. We're down about here now. The first uh, even 50 parts per million of CO2 has a strong effect, which is uh, very positive for us here on Earth. But at the, at the stage we are now, there is decreasing uh, impact of increasing levels of CO2. And, um, you know, that's really showing that we now are in a situation where further increases of CO2 will have minimal further warming on the climate. Looking at the same for methane, uh, again, where you know, Happer and Weingarten in their experimental work have shown that the, the effect of changes in methane concentration are actually very, very small. And that is in direct contradiction of the IPCC approach which claims that methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, yes, it is in a, on its own in, in a dry atmosphere. But in the real world, in the real atmosphere, uh, the impact of increasing methane and nitrous oxide, the other uh, greenhouse gas coming from agricultural emissions, is actually very small. 
And, and that has uh, profoundly important uh, conclusions for the agricultural sector. That, uh, you know, there is so much uh, pressure to reduce um, cattle, uh, methane emissions of all kinds, that it, it really is, there is no basis in the real science. Uh, methane has risen, yes, uh, gradually, but it's still very much in parts, parts per billion, very, very tiny um, uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. Yeah, the CO2 um, has increased uh, steadily since um, it was started measurement in the Mauna Loa uh, measurements and in Hawaii. Uh, the atmospheric CO2 level is increasing uh, steadily, going up about two, three parts per million per year, but it's still uh, at 0.04 percent. It is tiny in, in presence in the atmosphere. Uh, this uh, this this graph rather naughtily puts in at the, the various stages, the, the various uh, conference of the party COP meetings that have taken place. And while all of these produce great uh, uh, resolutions about reducing CO2 emissions, they've done nothing at all uh, in terms of achieving that. It's interesting looking forward that uh, the modeling of CO2 emissions going forward would appear to be reaching about 560 parts per million in by the year 2100. So that's interesting. That would be a doubling of the pre uh, of the end of the ice age level of, of 280 parts per million up to 560 by the year 2100. Um, there's a, some very interesting lessons being learned. For example, in 2020, the COVID pandemic had, a, as you all know, a huge impact on reducing uh, commercial activity around the world, it produced only a 6% CO2 uh, reduction in that year. But as you can see from the curve, there's absolutely no deflection, no, no impact. And that is because anthropogenic CO2 emissions are a tiny part of the total carbon cycle, only 4 or 5%, only a tiny part. So, I mean, that is telling us very clearly the world is, has done an experiment showing that mitigation has minimal impact on uh, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 and therefore, by implication, minimal impact on the climate. There's another very important lesson here that by the year, here we are now, we're about at 420 parts per million. That is actually 50% above the uh, the post ice age, little ice age figure of 280, we're exactly 50% up, but yet the actual global temperature has risen by about 1.1 degrees uh, for that 50% CO2. But since that um, is logarithmic and we know declining, if you do the simple maths on the back of an envelope, you would point uh, that there's only about by 2100, when the, the uh, CO2 levels have doubled to uh, pre-industrial, that you get only about 1.6 degree rise. In other words, only a half a degree further from now. So um, it's really beginning, the world is beginning to tell us, the real world is beginning to tell us that certainly the, the growth in uh, rise in temperature is very, very modest going forward uh, through the rest of this century. And certainly, we do not appear to be in an emergency situation. The uh, various IPCC reports over the last uh, 32 years have been trying to estimate what the actual rise in global temperature will be due to a doubling of CO2. And that doubling, a doubling of CO2, the impact on temperature is called, they call the climate sensitivity which is a measure of how potent greenhouse gases are. And uh, despite uh, work, six assessment reports since um, 1988, approximately, um, there, uh, IPCC have been unable to calculate, believe it or not, and have it as, as in a sort of band of about uh, two degrees up to uh, five degrees or so, even, even wider in some cases. So IPCC, despite all the trillions being built, being spent on uh, research, have been unable to tell us how much they believe the world is going to warm. 
But of course, the 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 the, the media keep looking at the highest figure and telling us we're on a doomsday path. But research has shown, and and one of the greatest research has been done by uh, Linson, Professor Dick Linson, uh, and he came to the conclusion that it was about one and a half degrees, sorry, one degree. And our own Professor Ray Bates has produced even more uh, scientific evidence to the to the effect that the rise in temperature, the uh, climate sensitivity due to doubling our CO2 is only about one degree. So that evidence we know has been ignored by IPCC. So it really reduces the credibility of their reports. And despite all the, the money being spent on research by them, uh, they are actually obviously exaggerating. And, and that is, at this stage, very, very disappointing. Their models are way overheated. They're not taking the latest uh, science on board. As I said, you know, the carbon cycle is extremely complicated. Uh, there are um, the, the deposits in the earth, in the ocean, all the plants um, and various other natural mechanisms of, of carbon exchange between earth, between the ocean, between uh, the atmosphere. And here, you know, the, the anthropogenic bit is actually only tiny in part of all of that and really begins to put it in perspective that, you know, uh, while IPCC regard uh, CO2 as the control knob, there is far more at play, which they uh, seek not to acknowledge. And, you know, one can ask the question, um, what what would happen if um, the, 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 this was done in the case of, of the United States, if uh, by John Christie and uh, Roy Spencer, that if you went to, to zero emissions in 2012, this was dated some years ago, what would the difference in temperature be by 2100? It's only a fraction of a degree. So, I mean, it's just showing uh, that CO2 reduction regulation is tiny in effect. Uh, and, you know, you that raises the question is, why are we on this uh, mitigation uh, track? And, and, you know, not taking the latest science on board. So it raises very, very serious questions of where we are going. Is the sun a cause of, of the climate change? Yes, obviously back in, in the 1600s, uh, 1700s and, and 1800s, we had the, we've, uh, even back then, they began to understand about solar cycles, the 11 year solar cycle. And by counting the number of sunspots, they got a very good um, measure of the strength of the sun, solar activity. And yes, the low solar activity did give extremely cold weather through the the Maunder minimum and the Dalton minimum, and um, but you know in modern times we in the nineteen mid nineteen hundreds yes there there was a solar maximum, um, and but you know and that probably was some addition uh, to the the warming of the earth, but certainly it cannot explain everything. A very recent work uh, has been done by Ronan, Ronan Connolly, an other Irish researcher, and he has done excellent work in analysing whether the, the impact of solar uh, changes on the climate were more important or less important uh, than CO2. And at the end of all of that work, they came to the conclusion that, yes, it might be or it might not be, but certainly uh, it depends how you measure the solar radiation. Uh, that's that's particularly important. So there's a very open question as to the clearly the sun has impacts and has had impacts in on a centennial and millennial basis. But in the current uh, couple of centuries, it is difficult to discern uh, the impact of solar. You know, there has there were some questions: uh, Are we heading into another Dalton minimum? Because the, the recent solar cycles of 23, 24, 25, again, based on counting the number of some spots, did appear to be mimicking the, the lead into the uh, Dalton minimum. But uh, it, it now appears that solar cycle 25 is going to be reasonably strong. So it's discounting that theory that um, 
we are heading into a, a minimum based on, on decline in solar activity. Uh, for the moment, it, it is continuing more or less in line with cycle 24. But, you know, further ahead in centuries ahead and, and, and thousands of years ahead, certainly the solar effect may come back into play again. There's very interesting work being done as well by Svensmark and Shaviv on the impact of cosmic rays on climate. And that is amplifying changes in solar activity into uh, changes of, of uh, climate on Earth. That That uh, is certainly can explain a lot of the paleoclim paleoclimatic exchanges, changes in climate. Uh, but uh, again, is, you know, part of the overall understanding of how climate is changing. And of course, IPCC does not look at these, net, does not look at solar, it discounts it. Uh, that is a, a big problem. It relies solely on CO2, which is not the case. Moving on and beginning to look at some uh, observations, uh, what they tell us about climate. Um, looking at sea level rise, uh, coming out of the the the, the last uh, glacial, uh, yes, sea level was then about 130 meters below the current level. Believe it or not, that was because uh, being so cold, uh, all the the sea uh, had fallen as snow on on land, and therefore uh, was frozen solid, and therefore sea levels had had declined. And but moving forward, as as the that we moved into the Holocene, sea level began to rise quite quite uh, rapidly around the the, the uh, younger Dryas time, and moving forward gradually moved up and uh, actually increased by about 130 meters. But over the last eight thousand years, through the Holocene, has been pretty constant. So it's amazing, despite the cooler and warmer periods of the Holocene that I have spoken about, uh, sea level has been pretty constant, thankfully, and um, you know it, it is has not suffered any dramatic changes. Looking at sea level in somewhat more detail, um, the the uh, satellite records show that over the last forty years or so, for which we have satellite data, is showing a seasonally varying uh, rate of about three millimeters per year rise in sea level. Uh, but however, the tide gauges of over a hundred years tell us that it is typically between one and two millimeters per year, depending on the parts of the world, but on average, uh, for example, actually East Coast US, the, the, the land is uh, sinking slightly and that makes it appear that sea level is rising more rapidly uh, than it actually is. Um, so taking those, even taking the higher level, the satellite figure, projecting eight, 80 years forward gives about 25 centimeter rise in sea level by the year 2100, 10 inches. Again, no emergency. It's certainly not in the what the IPCC has been saying. So it's, it's a, a, yes, sea level is rising, but by very small level. Um, equally, there's no uh, IPC talk about so-called acidification. Um, no, the, the pH of the uh, ocean does vary somewhat, but is still very much in the alkaline region. And yes, Pacific islands are not sinking, as again, a lot of the popular media tell us, the Pacific islands, some have sunk somewhat due to water, uh, groundwater extraction. But certainly overall, they are not disappearing off the planet. Looking at the Arctic, yes, it has declined um, somewhat since 1979. But recall that I told you in a previous slide that 79 was the end of the cooling period. In other words, the Arctic was probably uh, greater in extent than it had been. And it's certainly going back uh, to the early 1900s their records of, of Arctic melt. And yes, it has declined going forward, but remarkably since the year about 2007, it's been uh, very, on average, quite static. Um, these of course are variations uh, that, that go up and down and it's all part of the natural process. But looking at the longer term record going back, you can see that the 
temperatures um, uh, of the Arctic were similar back in the 1930s. So, you know, is it, 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 and probably the Arctic uh, did uh, melt considerably during the, the um, Dust Bowl days. So the Arctic, yes, is, is declining somewhat. It's static recently, but no, Al Gore was wrong. It, it's not disappearing. And by the way, polar bears are doing just fine. Again, there was so much media coverage of polar bears going extinct uh, because of climate change. That is not the case. They are in fact thriving. Looking at Greenland, again, you get regular scares of the Greenland melting, but in fact, it, it going back in, in uh, the, the Dust Bowl times, the 1930s, the temperatures were about similar to about now. And even going back former into the Holocene, uh, um, there was much less ice on on Greenland. Uh, but and you know, the the real world tells us the Vikings went to Greenland as, because it was green back about nine eighty five, and lived there for four hundred years, growing barley and crops. Had to leave about 1300, 1400 as as the little ice age came on. Another piece of very interesting history is that during World War II, um, and a couple of uh, aircraft crash landed on Greenland. And, uh, you know, they were found recently uh, 10 to 30 meters deep in snow. Uh, that tells a story in itself. And they have been dug out and because they're so well preserved are now flying again, those two airplanes. The Arctic is the coldest in the last 2000 years in terms of the east and west and, and the whole of the Arctic, uh, temperatures have been declining um, and are at, you know, at, at record lows at the moment. Um, it's, it's strange that um, uh, the temperatures are the, uh, and the satellite te temperatures tell us as well, that the northern hemisphere is the part that's warming, whereas the southern hemisphere is generally getting colder. And that, again, is not explained by IPCC. A very interesting thing is that under the Arctic, there, there are Antarctic, there are 90 uh, volcanoes which are actually dormant. Um, and and uh, that's another uh, story, but uh, they're actually dormant. And, and uh, typically another scare to story recently, we were told that the Antarctic had lost three trillion tons of ice over the last 25 years. But again, what the media don't tell you is that that was only 0.1% of the total mass. So, you know, it's all about perspective and looking at the real facts. In terms of glaciers, um, the uh, Alaska glacier, um, glacier Bay, that in itself tells a very interesting story. Whereas uh, back around 1750, the glaciers were right out to the mouth of the bay. But as you can see in the slide, it receded back and back and back up to where it is now, about 65 mi miles inland. And I mean, that, that started back happening about 1750. So, you know, it that is not, it, it, yes, it's a climate warming, but it's not CO2 related. And similarly, other... Um, uh, glaciers, uh, many have melted and very interestingly shown previous evidence of previous warm periods. So, you know, the, the, the melting of glaciers is a natural process. They uh, formed uh, probably about uh, 400, 500, maybe even a thousand years ago, uh, are melting now as part of the natural process. But, you know, the really interesting thing is that they reveal evidence of previous warming periods. Extreme weather events, um, so much the media like to broadcast uh, as often as possible, disaster pictures of floods, fires, everything going wrong. But, you know, doing a really detailed and objective analysis of these does show that in most cases, these are not unprecedented. Things did happen in the past. And, you know, even IPCC, it contradicts itself in its own report. In its detailed uh, physical uh, science report, it did say uh, that all of these events 
there was no increase uh, in terms of detection or attribution in, in flooding, meteorological drought, hydrological drought, cyclones, winter storms, thunderstorms, tornadoes, hail, lightning, extreme winds. Even IPCC themselves admitted there was no evidence for increasing weather extremes. Yes, there is some evidence for increasing of heat waves, heavy precipitation, which is not unexpected in a slightly warming world, and some forms of drought, and in fire weather, yes, uh, that, you know, is, is part of, of the slight warming that we're in now. So there's extreme hype on, on these so-called extreme weather events, but when analysed um, objectively, uh, most are they have precedence in the past and are not increasing uh, in an unprecedented way. Heat waves, uh, you know, IPC said, tells us, oh, gosh, they're increasing since 1950. But what they failed to do is look back at, again, the Dust Bowl periods of the 1930s. So, you know, heat waves are, yeah, in recent times increasing, but they're not as bad as, as even in the past century. And both in terms of the frequency and the magnitude, you see, around the 1930s, they were exceptionally uh, hot. But on the other hand, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, they, there's been unusually cold winters. Again, the media don't broadcast that. Winter snow is not decreasing. Again, the, the prophets of doom were telling us that uh, snow will be a thing of the past. But uh, in fall and winter, yeah, there have been record levels in, in North America in the recent winter. And the important thing to remember from all of this that the mortality from cold events is of an order of magnitude greater than, than heat events. So uh, good things being told there, but reality is in, in all of this. Droughts over the last thousand years, there have been droughts, yes, but not, you know, it's on average, it's, it's, it's remained remarkably constant. And, you know, that is derived from tree ring proxies and, uh, even during the medieval warming period, uh, droughts were not noticeably high on average. Yes, there were clearly at various times droughts, um, but uh, it, it's not exceptional. And and that you know again, the media keep telling us, uh, telling us about the droughts that are happening uh, as being exceptional, and unprecedented. But history does not confirm that. Rainfall, the, the one of the longest. Uh, records of history are based on Irish and UK data where we have a lot of rain and <laughs> there are good records um, uh, since about 1710. But overall, on average, it's been amazingly constant. There have been very extremely wet years and extremely dry years. So uh, again, a uh, matter of perspective um, and the, the longer term trend is really what matters. And it's remarkably static, possibly some increase in, in recent decades, but not significant compared to the, the overall longer term trend. Um, and again, floods are nothing new. This this picture of just uh, places in Germany just shows the various uh, flood levels of the past. And this uh, in Denmark just shows the, the amazing floods that had occurred in the past as well. And equally, you know, California's great flood of 1862 uh, the evidence tells us, you know, floods are nothing exceptional. <clears throat> what is happening in some cases is that, you know, when there are floods, because of in extremely developed urban areas, the, the same flow off possibilities don't exist. So you can get more extreme flooding uh, because simply of the buildup of uh, buildings and houses and, and uh, infrastructure. On, you know, the, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, we had a great lecture recently from Peter Ridd, uh, whose um, life story is indeed a, a true um, indication of, of truth in reporting. And he got fired from the James Cook University of Australia for telling the truth about corals. Yes, they had uh, come back about 2012, but uh, they were recovering. And he has documented that. And now... Uh, there's a record high of corals in the Great Barrier Reef. So it's, it's you know, 
again, the media keep telling us that there's disaster there, but that that is not true. The facts just show that uh, Carl is now at a record high level again. Looking on into um, uh, fire trends, uh, believe it or not, in terms of the US, um, again, the, the biggest fire trends were ba way back in the Dust Bowl 1930s in terms of area burnt. And, you know, it's it's much less nowadays compared to what it was in the past. And not many people mention that. Australia, too, had its peaked in, in number of fires in the 1970s. And, you know, again, in both of those areas, you know, green regulations preventing the cut down of scrub under forests, uh, trees, uh, has led to an increase of, of fire uh, damage. So, you know, it's it's something that, you know, the green thing has gone too far in some cases that not allowing the removal of scrub has actually led to more fire activity. In Europe, yes, there's also been a decline in burnt areas uh, since 1980. And believe it or not, in some southern uh, European countries, in, in, uh, the, there's been a, there's strong evidence of arson activity causing the increase in, in burn, recent increases in burning activity. But overall, it's declining. And the global uh, uh, burnt area declined from 2003 to 2015. So again, you know, that's not what the media is telling you on the nine o'clock news. Uh, the, the facts tell a much different picture. The really positive thing about CO2 is beneficial to plant if through uh, increasing photosynthesis and enabling plants to better survive dry periods. And, you know, over the last uh, 40 years, there's been a remarkable greening of the planet in terms of the revival and growth of, of um, plants, uh, trees, and so on. And, you know, the, the color code tells you by how much it has increased. And it really is a, a impressive that, uh, except from the, the very arid uh, desert areas, there has been a remarkable increase in um, uh, photosynthesis and in vegetation growth, which can be seen uh, from satellite images. And that, again, this picture just again verifies the in an experimental context, the, the increased growth due to increased CO2 levels, where, you know, for these various uh, increases in CO2 ppm, uh, there is a remarkable uh, increase in, in the rate of growth. And that, too, has been uh, reflected in the state in the yield of crops. You know, as CO2 rises, uh, the, the, uh, the yields of uh, coarse grains, rice, wheat, have increased. Of course, there are other factors in that, such as uh, nitrogen fertilizers and you know greater efficiency and so on, and more um, hardy uh, seeds and all that. But you know the 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 world um, uh, crops uh, and food yields are actually rising, which is great news as the world population grows, um, and CO two is helping us, if you like, to feed the world's growing population. The other good news is that the climate related deaths due to floods, droughts, storms, wildfires and so on has decreased <clears throat> remarkably over the last century. And is now at, at a much lower level. Um, so, you know, then that is the good news that's not told. I mean, you, you are told of deaths and so on and floods and fires, but it, they, it is much lower than it was a century ago. And, you know, all of the the, the the prophets of doom, they've all proven for, for false. Uh, the, the snow disappearing, the Arctic going and so on. It's, you know, since uh, all of those days of prediction since 1970, they've actually been all proven false, which is uh, extremely good news. Looking forward and moving into the energy uh, scene and, and uh, talking a little bit about that. You know, going forward, and this is from the BP Energy Outlook for for up to 2040. And, you know, the, the yes, the world's energy usage has grown um, in terms of, of sector. I mean, it's, it's buildings, um, uh, commercial industry and, and uh, transport. 
and you know, between now and 2040, that's the timeline they took, there's probably going to be another 20% increase there in energy usage uh, due to population growth, urbanization, higher standards of living. And, you know, the, the real growth is going to happen in the developing parts of the world. Um, OECD is static, maybe declining. China is probably on a plateau now. Um, India certainly will grow strongly. Um, and other areas, including Africa, though Africa is still very small, despite Africa having the same now, the same population as China or India, is still remarkably small. And, you know, uh, the, the uh, sorry, sorry if it's hidden behind here, but the part that's due to renewables, even in 2040, will be only a fraction, maybe 10, 15 percent of the total global energy supply. We will be relying about 75 percent still on fossil fuels. That is what the real world is telling us. And, you know, the um, in terms of looking at the particular growth uh, that happened in 2018, most of it happened in China, uh, some in the US, some in India, uh, Africa is very small. But, you know, we're all talking of the Paris Agreement. Only the US, the Western world is involved in the Paris Agreement. And, you know, going forward, these all these particular regions, uh, particularly India, Russia, uh, Africa are going to be growing. And that that is, you know, really going to push in uh, energy demand going forward. So we're, we're going crazy into renewables. I mean, the, the, there's the uh, huge pressure in Europe as well as I know in North America now uh, to go for wind generation. But that that is uh, big question marks over it. It's unpredictable in terms of its ability to supply, unreliable. It disrupts the grid uh, because it has to involves uh, uh, voltage trans uh, change from uh, the the wind turbine into. Uh, batteries and then into the system, you know, it, it's it's very very inefficient overall. The um the the and and it's a way it's very ex, uh, demanding on space on metals on on uh, very inefficient technology overall. And you know the real problem is we do not have energy storage, and it has to be realized that the electrical grid cannot store energy except on you know a millisecond basis. Uh, and a lot of people don't seem to understand that. They, they think wind energy will be the answer. But yeah, it will supply energy when the wind blows. But when the wind doesn't blow, there is no energy. And, and that is the real problem about renewables. OK, uh, solar panels uh, can be somewhat more reliable, particularly if they are matching uh, uh, air conditioning demand in very hot climates. You know, and this, this is the problem uh, looking at any... This is the case of Ireland over two weeks. There are the daily peaks, uh, and, and this is a typical wind energy profile, which is all over the place. So you are left with an extremely difficult problem of matching the total demand to conventional generation and, and wind generation. And what is happening is that conventional generation is having to modify its, its output uh, very um, dramatically and, and uh, rapidly to try and accommodate the, the wind uh, profile. And, you know, the real world tells us that as the percentage of wind and solar on a system go up, so does the price of electricity. Uh, it's completely false, the, 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 the thought that wind and solar are free of charge. Yes, they are on the blade of the turbine or on the solar panel, but the reality is because of the complexity of incorporating such an irregular and unpredictable, non-dispatchable supply into the grid really does create big problems and causes extra costs, which drive up the cost of electricity. They don't drive it down. You know, the electric vehicle uh, conundrum again uh, is questionable um, whether the, the push to, to electric is the right thing. Uh, and this, um, graph here just gives a demonstration of the total uh, CO2 emissions uh, in terms of grams per kilometer traveled by uh, conventional versus electric vehicles. You know, here you have the conventional electric vehicle 
um, then then a diesel and then a plug-in hybrid. And yes, they are reducing the the uh, CO two per kilometer. Okay, electric vehicles if it's charged uh, by um, renewables, uh, then yes, it has a very low um, CO two emission. And of course, if it's part conventional and part renewable, it's not so efficient. And if it's charged by coal-powered uh, generation, then it is worse than, than, than conventional uh, petrol car. So you know, it's it's um, it's not uh, it's not the easy answer. And uh, electric vehicles are not by any means uh, the 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 answer. There's a big debate. And also taking into account the life cycle of the um, gathering of the, the the cobalt, the raw materials in in darkest parts of Africa, using children to to mine stuff, and the end of life batteries, how you recycle them. So, in my view, the banning of internal combustion engine vehicles is wrong until the the um, uh, technology on of electric vehicles moves forward. And I think there should be customer choice. But of course, there's an open debate on all of that. The other thing that's not recognized is that um, moving towards the energy transmission transition requires much greater quantities of the metals, the conductors, copper, nickel, cobalt, and the more uh, graphite, lithium, and so on, way beyond the currently available supplies. So that is really going to constrain uh, moving forward through the energy transition. And, you know, there are going to have to be a lot more mines for these materials. Sources have yet to be identified. And that is taking place in, in the, the most inhospitable countries in the world, uh, such as Afghanistan. But the thing to remember is that China has all the aces in its hand. It is the major supplier of, in particular, the rare earth elements um, and holds all the cards in its hand uh, in that area of technology. You know, uh, talking of social justice, banks have been banning coal projects, and, and that really is where Africa needs energy. It's got coal indigenously. And way back in 2010, the World Bank, because of its dedication to climate change and thinking that CO2 was the, the, the world evil, um, uh, started banning coal projects, and, and that very severely affected Africa in particular and various other banks followed on. And the result is, you know, Africa is the dark continent. This picture, if you, if you this is Europe up here with the, the bright night lights, Spain, Italy, and so on. And here's Africa, you can see mostly dark, except for Northern Africa around Nigeria, some parts in, in Southern Africa. So, you know, the, there's real injustice coming out of all this climate action that Africa is being left in the dark. And here it is with a population equivalent to that of China or India, and uh, its growth is being stunted. And, and you know, that this is the picture that's not being taken into account in the whole um, uh, climate strategy, call it that. Moving and finally moving towards looking at some real numbers on, on climate change. Um, over the last 50 years, uh, sorry, since, since over the last 30 years, since 1990 up to 2020, we know how much the, the forcing uh, uh, due to the greenhouse effect has been. And, you know, it's been linear up to this. And supposing we were to set and achieve a real target of being globally net neutral, zero uh, CO2 emissions by 2050, the actual effect it would have one can now calculate would be a, zero, a 0 0.2 degree centigrade saving in the next 30 years. And that's if the whole world went to zero carbon emissions tomorrow. And, you know, that, that, that dramatic, which is totally impossible, but it just shows the, the tiny benefit of um, uh, mitigation. You know, and, and looking forward, the, the uh, on a world basis, yes, we said 0 0.2 uh, degrees. If it was just the West went to zero carbon, it would be that. USA, only that. You know, there are tiny fractions of a degree actually warming stopped by the year 2050 or by the year 2100, if we were to go to zero by then. 
And, you know, the reality is we cannot that quickly do it. But if we were, it's good. And very few people understand this, that actually going to even zero carbon emissions will have minimal effect on the climate going forward. And the cost of that, McKinsey has put at $275 trillion, uh, you know, half the global profits. It's mind boggling amount of money that would be needed to get to net zero by 2050 or by 2100. And if you do the sums on it, it finds that, you know, for every billion dollars spent on mitigation, there would be a saving of only one four millionth of a degree. They're actually mind boggling figures. It really shows, you know, we really need to assess where we are and how we're going forward. So coming to some conclusions, and I hope uh, I, I've, I've gone through a lot of ground, and I hope it's made sense to you. You know, the, the IPCC models and the whole theory is greatly overheated. Simple estimates based on real world figures show that we're going to get something like a half to one degree further warming by 2100. That does not uh, beg any, any understanding of a crisis. Yes, we'll exceed the Paris 1.5 degrees by around 2050, but is that a problem? That is an arbitrary limit. We may hit towards the two degrees by 2100. Is that a problem? I think we can adapt to that. And as I had said, mitigation has really Im imperceptible impact. Mitigation is good, yes, where there are specific benefits from specific projects. For example, in retrofitting housing, where you get the benefit of um, saving fuel in the in the longer term, uh, better health for the inhabitants and so on. So yeah, there are some specific uh, areas where mitigation is good, but overall it's not going to save the planet. And in particular, methane uh, has a particularly tiny real, in, uh, real world greenhouse gas effect. And certainly there is not a basis for cutting back drastically on farming. Sea level is rising. But again, 25 centimetres by 2100, that is not a crisis. The, the Arctic, Greenland, Antarctic glaciers and oceans, there's nothing dramatic happening there. Extreme weathers are not generally unprecedented. They can be black swan events every now and then. Um, the climate is changing, uh, but let's adapt to it. Let's simply do the things if we need. If there's drought, we need better water supplies. If we need better infrastructure, let's do that. But let's spend the money wisely. Um, and, you know, on energy policy, affordable, reliable energy is absolutely essential to society. Many people seem to forget that. They think that you stick your plug into the wall and there it comes whenever you want the energy to even <laughs> drive this uh, conversation between us. Renewables are actually not viable until mass energy storage is available. It's going in the wrong direction. It's okay. It can help. Yes, it can reduce uh, use of fossil fuels, but overall it's, it's actually not the wise way to go. Fossil fuels, yes, will continue up to 2040 at least, probably 2050, maybe beyond, uh, will be an essential part of the energy mix. Uh, to get an energy transition, we need massive investment in the power systems, in the grid, simply so we can feed in energy and take it out in different places. Uh, net precious metals will be in great shortage. And, you know, for the longer term, mini nuclear seems to be the way to go. Agricultural policy, as I mentioned, we should not be, be culling cattle. It, it really, in view of a, a world that's still seriously undernourished, it is totally insane to be cutting back on agriculture. Um, our politicians, you know, we've been trying in the ICSF to get this message across, but no, I'm afraid politicians, that is uh, true, I think on both sides of the Atlantic and around the world are dumb and deaf to hearing what real science is saying. And, you know, the real threat in Europe certainly is energy security. A, a lot of the energy systems, because there's been so much investment in renewables and so little in conventional generation that there is real danger of energy blackouts between now and 2030. And the other great thing is, you know, from our own tough experience here in the ICSF, freedom of speech. 
um, I, I really value this opportunity of being able to say what I have said. But, you know, th there's a lot of people that, that just don't allow that kind of conversation. And even on social media, you get the fact checkers. They don't want to hear anything other than the IPCC uh, catastrophe narrative. We all, I do really emphasize, we all want a sustainable future, but let, let's base it on real science and solid engineering. Some homework, if you wish it, some the very good books that I'd recommend if you want to delve a bit further. Um, uh, the Tintel Group, the IC, I, ICSF belongs to an international Tintel Group, which represents uh, similar associations around the world. All of the independent side scientists belong to it. And um, they have produced a major critique of the uh, recent IPCC report. And in fact, that will be the next lecture of our ICSF group in uh, about two weeks time. False Alarm by Bjorn Lomberg. It's a good book to read. Read it, produce a lot of common sense. Uh, Patrick Moore's Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. Bit amusing, but it has it is true. A great book to read is Stephen Coonan. You will have heard of him in North America. He explains what that climate science is unsettled, and it is important to understand that. A great book on past climate is uh, H. H. Lam. He was a meteorologist uh, of of uh, previous decades and wrote a great book on climate history in the modern world. It really is worth reading. Most interesting to see how climate and, and uh, human life interacted. A very good book by the Global, Walls Policy Form, uh, Global Warming Policy Foundation on the feasibility of net zero uh, for the USA by 2050. Adaptation, another good work by the GWPF. And a very good educational book, if you're interested, uh, brought out by the uh, CO2 coalition in North America. So that's it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and uh, I'm sure that will stir up some good questions and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That that was more comprehensive than I had hoped and dreamed. That was fantastic. And uh, I think you've just established a really wonderful resource here that I encourage people to revisit after we've put this online. Um, the ability to just pull together things that are often treated in isolation is uh, is really valuable, inv invaluable, really. And already uh, there are a bunch of questions that have been popping up of people who uh, have itches that they would like to have scratched. So the first person who got in there is uh, Harinder. Harinder, if you're uh, if you're still there, you everyone <coughs> by default is on mute, so you have to unmute yourself. Uh, yes. So thank you, Jim, for an uh, amazing presentation that the whole world needs to see. I hope nobody will mind if I put it on uh, uh, Facebook and uh, send it to uh, Prime, Indian Prime Minister Modi to say that use India's position to, to debunk uh, as much as possible within BRICS and SCO to debunk uh, the IPCC projections. Is, is that, was that be objectionable to you, Matthew, or to Jim, if I were to do that? Okay, so moving on to my question, I've read somewhere that in addition to all the shortcomings of the green energy that you've described, that the solar panels themselves contain a quite a significant amount of toxic material, including lead. And similarly with the wind turbines, they are uh, they they. Uh, emit a great deal of, uh, I forget if, if it's carbon or some kind of pollutant is, is released by these wind turbines. And in any case, both of them are have very short lifespans, 20 to 30 years only, after which those panels and those turbines must be dumped into the environment, causing uh, considerable toxicity. What is your opinion on that? Uh, thank you for those questions. Um... Yeah, solar panels do contain an array of quite uh, toxic materials. And in fact, once you have them up on your roof, when you later come to dismantle them, they are a hazardous waste. They will cost a lot of money to dispose of. Um, they are, again, a very inefficient use of precious metals. Um, they do have a quite a short lifetime. And, you know, it's, it's talking of 10 years 
sort of 20 at the very most, and they will decline in, in output. Uh, wind turbines, yes, uh, do have again a limited lifetime and there is a tremendous problem of disposing of uh, used wind turbine blades. They're so huge and again contain so many um, metals of various kinds that they cannot be, there's no, yet no technology for recycling them. And, you know, a thing I didn't actually mention is that there are very serious negative biodiversity impacts of wind turbines uh, onshore in terms of um, bird killing, uh, that is well established. And when they're offshore, additionally, uh, the problems of, of sound transmitted down into the seabed and vibration uh, causing very severe loss of biodiversity around the basis. And I think there's been a lot of that proven in, in North America as well, in terms of the, the wind farms they're proposing off um, New York and, and uh, Massachusetts, uh, that the, the, their uh, evidence of whales being, being uh, driven away and killed in the process. So, you know, all of those things are, again, saying that, uh, you know, the, the, the use of renewables, that is, um, uh, solar and wind, is very questionable in, in the medium. And, uh, and, you know, there isn't a longer term. They are very much short term uh, investments of 10 to 20 years. So, in effect, they are, they, instead of protecting the environment, they constitute a very significant threat as well in addition to providing very inefficient and unreliable energy sources. <laughs> you, you said it, yes. You have summarized it well, yeah. And that, that is why I argue that um, renewables in that context uh, is not good investment. It is, of course, the flavor. And it, here in Ireland, there's just been approval for a huge number of wind farms to be constructed in, in the coming decade. And OK, that's what the Greens want. It's supposedly saving the planet, but that's showing the, the wrong direction, if you like, of this whole uh, climate and energy policy, unfortunately. Thank you. One follow up question. These extreme weather events that you said have been seen even in the past. Uh, could, could it be possible that uh, geoengineering technology such as the, it has been reported, the Pentagon has developed, it's called a high altitude aurora, something H-A-R-P technology. Could they be orchestrating some of these events? Well, I, I know that, yes, certain groups are postulating geoengineering to solve what they see as a possible a coming climate emergency. But um, I hadn't thought that they were um, yet being tested out at any scale. Um, uh, I hadn't known about that. It is possible. Um, I do know, for example, it has been shown that some wind turbine farms are so big that they do affect the local climate downstream of those and can cause changes in, in, wind, in uh, rain precipitation patterns. And that actually has caused some flooding events that were, okay, deemed to be climate change, but actually are due to the wind turbine farms. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, go for it. Hi, uh, Jim. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I wanted to come back to uh, the sun, the role of the sun, and uh, especially uh, sunspots. So as far as I know, um, the counting of sunspots is one of the, the oldest measurements we have. I think it goes back to the 700s. And... Um, I have here, well, I don't know if I, it's a quote from the NASA's website who uh, says basically that while the sun has played a role in the past climate changes, so they acknowledge that you know, it has some role in it, uh, the evidence shows the current warming cannot be explained by the sun. So I've, when talking about climate change um, and mentioning the role of the sun, I've been the answer that I get back a lot of the time is that, um, you know, it was the sun was playing part in the, in the past, but not anymore. And, you know, they throw NASA a lot back at you. So um, what would be your answer to this? So is it because now we have a lot more of measurements uh, as well as the sun to counteract the effect or is it really 
something else? Uh, yes, as I had said in my presentation, the sun sure did affect um, the, the, the paleo climate and the various uh, cycles, Milkanovich cycles over the last 450,000 years. Um, and clearly, yes, did have an effect in, call it the Maunder minimum, the, the, and, and leading into the Little Ice Age. Uh, they were solar effects predominantly, and yes, were measured by sunspot counts. But uh, what I was trying to explain is that in the current modern scenario, even though we know the sunspot count is going up and down, it's difficult to trace that uh, to um, the precise changes happening in recent decades. You know, it's difficult at a short time to, to, to identify the, the, the role of the sun. And again, as I'd mentioned in both the uh, Henrik Svensmark and, and uh, Mir Shaviv, they've done great work in linking cosmic rays, which are influenced by the sun and greatly amplify changes in uh, sun activity into more amplify the effect on the Earth's climate. Uh, all of that is, so to speak, emerging science and, and uh, it is difficult and is, is doubtless part of the current uh, situation. And, but yet there are the other natural impacts, as I mentioned of El Nino, La Nina. So it's, it's a very complex mix of things playing into what affects climate on a year to year basis. And we don't fully understand that. And, and certainly IPCC doesn't and doesn't want to because it, it, it thinks it's all CO2, but that is, it's not, it's much more than CO2 that is playing in. The sun is part of it, was certainly in the past, but it's difficult to see how much it is part of the current climate change scenario. So you would say that something changed? Like, I'm, because I'm trying to understand how you can say that, well, not you specifically, but we can say that um, in the past, the sun played a role, but now we were not sure. Like what? What changed? Uh, yeah, going back into the Milkanovich cycle, it was really the, the physical uh, rotation of the, the Earth around the sun uh, mm -hmm. and changes in the orbit that caused very major changes. Um, in the, uh, call it the leading into the Little Ice Age, the, um, the uh, the cold periods that occurred were clearly due to major declines in the number of sunspots. We don't know why or how that happened, but um, as I was trying to explain, in the current recent solar cycles, 11 year cycles, it, they have been more or less constant. They are going up or down, and therefore the sun now is playing less into the role of modern climate, call it that. Uh, there had been the thought that the solar cycle 25 was going to be a lot lower, a lot smaller. But uh, the, 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 the story so far on it indicates that the number of sunspots is pretty typical of previous cycles. So that's why the sun in the recent decades is playing less of a role than it was in, in the past. Okay, so there's some kind of noise that we're not sure uh, what it is yet. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we don't, uh, there are um, some scientists who are really deep into, like Sarkova, deep into studying uh, yes. sun cycles. And, and she has produced projections that, yeah, uh, it's warming and then we're going to hit a really cold period. Um, yes. <laughs> and she may be right. She may well be right. Um, but uh, in, in just looking at the current cycles, the sun isn't changing dramatically. We, as I mentioned, it did look as if we were going to into a low uh, cycle 25, but so far it's it's more or less normal. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I add a comment there, Jim? Please don't. Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert in this area, but just to, first of all, the first reaction I have is that the effect of the sun, whatever it is, I say on Earth's climate um, is, you know, is 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 complex in that it may not just be the direct 
heat output of the sun. That's one possibility, but it's it's not necessarily the variation in the output of the sun. It can be a lot of other factors, um, such as uh, ionic particles and also interaction with the Earth's magnetic field and um, other things. But the, the, I think the broader part issue here as well that I would like to emphasize is that, um, you know, in, in rebutting the false claims that come from various places, be it IPCC or media or politicians or whatever, you know, they, they throw out claims without any basis. We examine, we scientists examine the science and that all takes a lot of work. So with regard to, sorry, no, so what is clear and what is abundantly clear at this stage is that the, um, that the, the warming effect that we can measure, we know that only a very small part of that is related to greenhouse gases. And only a very small part of the greenhouse gases is related to anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And that's, and, and we know all about that. We know that that effect is so small, both on an experimental basis and on a theoretical basis. That much is clear. So in a way, I think, um, we might not like to know exactly uh, everything about the climate and what controls it and everything. Uh, but really, I think there was an onus on the people who make claims about it all, all the changes being due to anthropogenic effects. There was an onus on them to look at the evidence that, that we're presenting. And our experience is that the powers that be just don't want to know. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm just making that point. Yeah, of course, as it, we, we have a natural curiosity and in time, mankind and science will progress in our understanding of those things. But in the meantime, um, the, you know, the, what Jim has presented is really good news that the good news is that um, mankind and industrialization are not causing climate change. So there was an onus on those who, who are sticking to that to look at the science with regards to greenhouse gases um, and, and you know just to look at it, which they are refusing to do at present. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Because the facts are not in dispute. The facts that Jim has presented are not in dispute, actually. Nobody has disputed the facts about greenhouse gases that I know about. Yeah. Thanks, Donald. No, it's a good contribution. Yeah, it's a good reminder, too. I mean, that uh, there, there are legitimate things to be very, very concerned about in the world we live in. And the fact that this is not one of them is a great, it should be a great spiritual relief for many of us to focus our mm -hmm. energy and efforts on the real issues that we're, most people are not thinking about. Um, so this is, this is very, very good. Um, Jerry, I know you had a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Is my mute working? Your unmute is working. Here, here, I don't know yeah. if your mute is working. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much, uh, Mr. O'Brien, for educating us on that. Uh, just so you know, living here in Canada, you know, every winter when I wake up in the morning, I, I pray for global warming. And I really want to do everything I can to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. Yeah. So yeah. it's, part, it's partly my fault it's going up. But um, I had a question, but after listening to Harinder, I actually have two questions now. I hope that's okay. Um, <clears throat> the first one I had on the renewables, I remember reading an article, this was a couple of years ago, and it said that if you had put these solar panels on the roof of your house, 
that the fire department would not try to put it out if your house caught fire because they were worried with all the electrical connections and with the solar panels and everything. They weren't going to try to throw water on this thing. I don't know if that's still the case or if you've heard anything regarding that. I, I I haven't heard that particular one. I do know there are serious concerns about uh, fires in electric vehicles. That when a fire starts in a in a battery, that that is a really serious fire and very difficult to extinguish, and and is a serious concern for um, uh, car electric vehicles parked in parking lots or or being transported in ships. But I, you, you may be right. I can't say yes or no on the solar panel one. Yeah, I had read it a couple of years ago. There's been no stories since then, so I guess they want to keep it quiet. But I have a second question for you. And, <clears throat> you know, when you look at all the lies and the, the cherry picking of their statistics to make these graphs to scare us into this, you know, climate change nonsense, you know, if we actually believed their lies and took their statistics to be correct, just from a practical standpoint, <clears throat> my thinking is we would have to massively invest in an increase in mining. We'd have to massively increase the refining or manufacturing. We'd have to massively invest in rebuilding our electrical grid and upgrading it. We'd have to massively invest in energy storage. But of course, none of this is being done. Here, where I live in Canada, they built one new factory so they can build batteries for cars. So from a practical standpoint, they're doing none of the physical requirements that would be necessary to follow their own predictions. So I'm thinking there's only one other option. If you're not going to build any of this thing, your only other solution is depopulation. You would have to massively lower the population of the planet in order to go to this green utopian of theirs without any increase in production. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on this idea that their real agenda is depopulation. Thank you. And I must say, I'm very close with you in, in your thoughts. Um, yes, there would be massive investment required to, if we are to reach uh, towards net zero. Um, and, you know, this is all hypocrisy. They all talk about it, but yet do nothing. And, and actually, it's unaffordable. You know, the real world is saying we just don't have money to afford all these things. But as you say, there is a, a, a rather nasty, unhidden, hidden agenda that, you know, towards uh, depopulation, towards reduction in quality of life you know they they start talking of these 15 minute cities where supposedly everything is convenient but that in fact is is the beginning of climate lockdowns and it really is that serious that that um that human not only are are the thought processing be, being shut down but actually the physical enjoyment of of life some people the, the activists really want to do that. They want to shut down life. They want to make it more miserable, I suppose, in, in the belief that they're saving the planet. But, you know, that, that is totally mistaken and is, is a very sad state of affairs. And, and, you know, what's happening even, I can say, here in Ireland, that these, these some NGOs that are actually government funding are acting against the, in, the national interests. They are preventing projects, um, say, um, extension of, of uh, there's one recently of an alumina plant. They, they have prevented that. Their uh, uh, investment in cheese and other products, they, they've stopped that. And, you know, the, the country is beginning to be pushed into negative economic growth. And, and that that is the really unsavory part of this whole thing. There is this agenda and it's being driven 
you know, um, I think it's coming from these these billionaires uh, of the World Economic Forum. There is a very sinister agenda that, you know, close down the climate uh, and uh, close down the planet and, and keep people in, in an even tighter situation. That That is the very... Uh, we are walking into that situation and, and that is why our message on truth and objectivity in climate science and energy policy is so important because the, the, we are moving in, in a wrong direction. I think Brian has a, uh, a thought. Yeah, I just want to build on what uh, Jim and the previous questioner has had to say. The danger is that having listened to this phenomenal paper, and thank you, Jim, again, as a colleague, that we say, oh, we now know the answers, and we ride off into the sunset, and we are complacent, and we say, isn't that bloody wonderful? Now, unless something happens to convert what I call either the knaves or the ignoramuses who are calling the tune at the moment, we are going down the hill at a rate of knots. The IPCC, in the eyes of most people, is regarded as the epitome of the source of all science. They are not a scientific organization, but most people think they are. And we've had a, Jim just mentioned it uh, recently, we had a, an announcement here in our little country the other day about huge uh, offshore wind farms. This went on and on and on, and there wasn't a single mention of what our Canadian friend has mentioned, infrastructure, or in fact, standby generation. For every megawatt, depending on wind, what are you going to do when that wind doesn't blow? This is being ignored, either through ignorance or by what we call in Ireland, cute tourism, that people know the answer, but they're not prepared to come out with it. So my wish and hope and prayer would be that the audience here this evening would become almost missionaries to dispel this dramatic and almost criminal shading of the whole situation. And as Jim says, becoming like anchorite monks, that we should live on the skelly rocks and be miserable for the rest of our lives to save grasshoppers and, and, uh, and, and, and birds and fish here and there. It's ridiculous. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking so much of your time. <laughs> no, that, that's very appreciated, Brian. And yeah, certainly that this is an identity question at the end of the day, because a lot of people, we're, we're, we're a little bit too used to living in the consumer society that involves also consuming information, not realizing that with knowledge become, comes responsibility. And that's a subjective question to now say, okay, well, what I have just learned, how can I change subjectively my relationship to a process that may not be my fault, but now I have a capability that I didn't have before while I was ignorant to make some amplitude of change, regardless of what, if it's big or small, you can be a conduit, an instrument for said change if you live your life accordingly. So it's a really good reminder, Brian. I, I very much appreciate that. Um, I just want to add one, in, one point, one short comment on this, Matthew. Sure. So the, the point of uh, the good, this being the good news that the climate change is not really happening is good news, but the bad news is what we have, what we now also know is that the, the, there is a very dark agenda, and one of the ways they are using to suppress the facts on on their agenda is, for instance, in the gender fluidity thing. Uh, they are taking the approach that anybody who speaks out against uh, gender fluidity is, or in favor, even, even in favor of traditional male-female marriages, is expressing, and I'm quoting our uh, political officials like the Foreign Minister of Canada, uh, expressing hate propaganda towards the LGBTQ. And this is likely to happen with climate change as well, at that uh, people who try to now spread this, uh, the factual information, uh, the time is not far when we will be attacked for spreading fake or disinformation about the climate change, that, that we should be prepared for that. And it's a, it's a very important thing to have this mission, but 
this expect the I I anticipate that reaction. It, it's it's we've definitely smelling already. very Orwellian. Well, yeah, did, did you want yeah, to respond yeah, to that? We've, we've experienced that very much here in Ireland. Uh, that you know we are very severely discriminated against, and uh, I know our own people in ICSF have very bad experiences, and and we are, you know, we we've campaigned as best we can, and and have made, you know. It's gone so far that we've been deliberately locked out of any debate on on climate policy and energy policy in Ireland. Uh, there was it started with a citizens assembly, and of course they were handpicked to give the right answer, and we were locked out of that. We were locked out of subsequent government discussions, uh, climate uh, committees between various government departments. We were locked out deliberately out of that. Um, we've made umpteen submissions as ICSF to our government ministers. We haven't even got a response. It, it's quite incredible and, and it's very unhealthy, this lack of communication. And, and maybe maybe you've been, it's more open in Canada, but as, as the previous speaker said, maybe it's going to get worse. Um, so, you know, that, that's why it needs a group. And I mean, I, I know there are... Um, similar groups to ICSF in Canada that there, there are, uh, I do have contacts and there are a lot of people working very hard in that area, but they're coming up against the same uh, negativism and discrimination. Yeah. yeah, freedom freedom is increasingly becoming the freedom to shut up, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and stay away from any discussion. Uh, all right, uh, we, uh, Jim, do you have time for maybe three more questions? Oh well, yeah, please. I'm I'm you know delighted and and thanks for such a receptive audience. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Paul Paul Gettel, are you? Yeah, there you are. Yeah, I had uh, two questions. I think they're, they're pretty short. Um, um, if I can, uh, one was that you mentioned that methane isn't uh, a powerful CO two gas anymore. Uh, what changed? I had just a vague memory of the argument from years ago about how potent methane was. Uh, what's changed in that understanding? Um, the, the IPCC view of methane is based on results um, based uh, in uh, kind of in a laboratory situation in dry air uh, when it's just taken on its own. But in the real world, where it's mixed with other greenhouse gases and in a humid climate, the effect then is much, much lower. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, this work has really been brought forward by um, Will Happer and William Van Weingarten, Will Happer from Princeton University and uh, Van Weingarten from Duke University. And you know what? They have been unable to publish their results to to climate censorship it is not accepted in the peer-reviewed media they have published it online yes but it just shows the uh, the impact of this climate censorship that they no uh, reputable uh, science publication will publish their work because it it pulls the carpet from under ipcc Okay, yeah, great. Um, then the other question is uh, something quite uh, different slant. Um, the Tesla Corporation recently uh, did a, a presentation of, uh, I think they called it the sustainable energy future. And it was a quite an expansive, long ranging study and presentation of a con rather concrete, I think, in my view, of how they could see things going forward, which was quite humorous if you <laughs> took the take home message from it was big and um in a positive way uh, uh, but uh, anyways i uh, have you reviewed what their uh, studies or their presentations and then yes have you any what's your critique of it yeah i think it was elon musk produced this uh, electrification of the planet basically uh, for was it a $11 trillion or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, in theory, yes, you could do it, uh, but it probably would cost far more than that. And, you know, there aren't the metals to do it. 
in Africa, they they yet don't have electricity supply in most cases. So, you know, it, it's a, a concept. Um, it's kind of a Silicon Valley dream. Yes, it's possible. But uh, yeah, in, in reality, the cost and all the other um, difficult realities come in and click in and, and uh, you know, there's where, you know, moving to electric vehicles in a country that yet doesn't have a power grid, that's not very sensible. You know, it, it comes back to those basics. Uh, um, you know, great that people have dreams and, and similarly there's dreams of if there are enough wind turbines around the world, they can connect them all together under the sea and send uh, power from, from Ireland down to Africa and solar energy from Africa up to Ireland. Um, that's all in theory possible, but in practical, it's unaffordable and, and uh, unattainable in the real world, engineering world. So far, maybe sometime in the future. Thanks. Ray Bates wants to come in, I see. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah Ray. Just come in, please. Um, yeah, uh, here in Ireland, uh, the media are almost 100% committed to the idea of propagating uh, the notion of a climate emergency. And it's almost impossible to get an alternative viewpoint heard, as Jim mentioned, in, in, the, in the media. I'm wondering if in Canada the same situation holds, or do you have some outlets, media outlets, that are willing to listen to an alternative viewpoint? In, in, in where, in Canada? Or, in, or where? in Canada, yes. Uh, oh, I, I, think, I think the people can correct me, but I, I, in my observations, it's a pretty ubiquitous problem. Um, there are some platforms out there, you know, that, that are uh, a little bit more open to these types of discussions, but in the mainstream, both on the left and on the right, you're going to find a big invisible firewall preventing actual reasonable thought from entering. <laughs> But yeah, there, there are some platforms. There are there are there are domains where a fight is happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nick. Nick Newman. Oh no, you're not Nick Newman. Oh yes. Actually, my name's Maureen. Yes, Maureen. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I still haven't changed it. Well, also, well, we'll get used to it. I'll, st I'll stick with the name Nick. Um, this is Kepler, by the way. Thank you very much, Matt. Fantastic name. Okay, don't you think so? My last one was Copernicus. <laughs> That's excellent. Anyway, hats off to you. Um, anyway, I had one question. It was about geothermal energy. And if anything's, I know people who are doing it on a personal basis or have companies that do it on a one-off basis for clients who have enough money to do it. But uh, what about um, it as a viable possibility if anybody's really seriously interested in coming up with viable possibilities? Would that be one? It comes back to economics. Um, geothermal, yes, great idea in Iceland or in New Zealand. And they, in New Zealand, they have quite a bit of their power supplied from geothermal. Uh, because they have semi-active semi volcanoes. Um, but yes, a, in, yes, there, there are probably areas, yes, where you could drill down and, and extract heat from underground. Um, it has been proposed uh, for years in Dublin, but it, just the economics just don't hang together. Um, of course, a, a slightly different variant on that is, is heat pumps, where again, you would heat your house extracting uh, heat from the underground or from the air. But again, they are prohibitively expensive. They, they do work, but yes, they are prohibitively expensive. Um, and uh, uh, generally just don't work out in economic terms. It, in, in principle, yes, good idea and great for energy, call it conservation, but uh, economics just don't, uh, ju just don't, I'm afraid work out in general. And my other uh, question was, because this is something that frustrates me all the time when you're trying to get an opposing argument out, but you're still dealing in the kind of uh, this um, thesis antithesis kind of situation where these paradigms have been set up so that the controlling narrative always dictates what the, what the argument is going to be. And so it just ends up being a yo-yo and or not a yo-yo, but a ping pong. 
So I wonder if you just don't have to go back to, don't ask me how, if you don't have to go back to that Buckminster state, Fuller statement, you have to build a new paradigm outside of the existing narrative. Were, were you able to hear that, Jim? Uh, not quite. Um... The Maureen was just saying that uh, there she, there's just this frustrating observation she was making that often the discussion is uh, is stuck within these controlled uh, paradigms, uh, the, these controlled discussions of uh, um, that if you abide by the rules of of what is permitted as the rules of debate with on these topics, then you don't really get anywhere. And what is required, she, uh, she referenced the need to re uh, return to what Buckminster Fuller had observed re regarding the need for a new paradigm um, to, to change the rules in which these debates or discussions even occur in the first place. I, th I think, Maureen, is that generally the gist of it? Yeah, and I don't know if it's whether maybe he was also referring to, well, any systems that don't work. And they're constantly reinvented uh, and they're barely improved. And then you have these random geniuses who come out, they think outside the box and they suddenly come out with something that, you know, is so obvious, but not until they think outside the paradigm. Um, and I don't know whether that has to happen. It always happens in these really small little ways um, until there's so many people doing it that people abandon the old paradigm and they end up switching to the new one. I don't know what those new paradigms are. I mean, clearly, I don't think these people who are espousing solar or anything else are really serious about doing any of it. I think it's just a smoke screen personally, but, right. um, you know, because they're not, well, it, it, none of it makes any sense and they're not dummies. So what the alternative paradigm is, and again, um, what's the alternative paradigm for arguing? I don't know. And what's the alternative paradigm for how one begins to free oneself from uh, the few alternatives that are put out there. And then how does one begin to do that as small collectives who can move out of that prescribed arena? I don't know. I mean, I, you, I can't answer that. We're able to hear yeah. you. You're, the, the sound quality is a little bit low, but I could hear basically what you were saying. Jim, were you able to make out the gist? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, the new paradigm is what we as climate realists are trying to say and and, you know, trying to advocate that you be that national countries and, and the world be sensible about what climate science is really saying and be sensible about uh, energy policy going forward. Um, and, you know, that's why it's so important that the ICSF and similar associations around the world, and, and there are a couple in Canada, I can send you details afterwards. Um, but, you know, that. Uh, that's why it's so important and so wonderful to have this audience here this evening and a new one that the message begins to get out and is listened to and that you can in turn begin to influence hopefully your politicians and and your local communities and begin to say look there is another side to the, all this climate stuff but mm -hmm. you know unfortunately the the current paradigm is so much reinforced by the buckets of money uh that is there to do it, you know, continue the, the 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 catastrophe narrative to make investments in alternative energy and renewables, and and you know, careers depend on it. You know, this whole funding for universities depends on how much uh, research you can do to 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 perpetuate this this climate uh, scare story, and and you know, that's why we have an uphill battle. But you know, I think realization will come that this whole climate narrative is going into territory which is costing a fortune of money is impossible to achieve and is disimproving our life quality of life yeah so i i think this it will come and maybe i'm optimistic that will happen in two or three years time by 19 by 2030 uh, at least um yeah so you know that's why our current mission of of broadcasting and disseminating realism in climate and energy policy is so important. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And I, I think part of this is is always capacity building individually, because we, we have to prepare ourselves for those moments, those opportunities where uh, we will be called upon, where opportunities to make changes are going to present themselves where currently they are not. 
And part of the 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 point that Jim, you you did really well um, in today's presentation and Q and A is just to get it, you, you got across just how self destructive and 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 uh, self inconsistent this dominant current green energy climate science paradigm is in, in the sense that it has no foundation that is viable. So they're trying to build a structure which is self-consuming. It, it's destroying itself. And you can only see that when they really try to do things like all of their their insanely uh, imag imaginative ideals to get to climate zero by 2050. And you just think through, like, how are you going to do any of these things in the practical real world? And you start realizing just how quickly this is so incompetent. And we have to have confidence in a sense that as people realize by 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 virtue of reality slapping us <laughs> again and again, when we realize that these ideas might look all symmetrical and pretty mathematically in a model, when you try to do them in reality, it blows up in your face and it doesn't work. It, it sinks and it's, it's designed to sink. And then people will increasingly, as we see with the parts of, of the world where they don't want to commit suicide, um, and you pointed out the examples that, you know, you have these, these nations that are able to achieve quite a lot in, in, in an incredible way in terms of, of uh, qualitative improvements in industrial output, abundance creation from Russia, China, India. And, and you realize that they're not nations, who, they're not signed on to the, the restrictions of the Paris Accords. I didn't even know that. I was really, I, I found that, that shocking and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's not like they, they've tricked us into signing on to the Paris Accords. They, they've just displayed what, what national governments that don't want to kill their people do. <laughs> and they're, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to follow suit and also create abundance. It's just that we've got this other thing holding us back, which people can, I think we've alluded to it a little bit. Um, but yeah, capacity building. Yeah. Def in, definitely. in fact, I think the, the West is going downhill, you know, through all of this climate stuff, unfortunately, while China, India are just investing, going ahead. Yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, that, that is the, and, and, you know, the, as I mentioned, Africa is just being left in the dark. It, it, mm. It's social injustice. Uh, Incredible yeah. level. Absolutely. Well, we have time for one. one. Oh, sorry. I was going to add one comment also. You know, I think if one is not doing the right deed for the right reason, uh, it's not going to work. You know, I used to be involved in an energy projects back in the 80s, and um, we were motivated to save energy. And the motivating factor in the background was the knowledge that fossil fuels are a finite resource. And on that basis, one can make a solid argument for conserving fossil fuels, making them last um, as long as possible, and also preparing for a future without fossil fuels. And I would call that doing the right thing for the right reason. And if one were to start from that position, um, it would the way one would do it would be completely different from the way it is being done. Because starting at that basis, first of all, not only are fossil fuels a finite resource, but so are all minerals. So we would not be going down proposing so-called solutions that involve creating un unimaginable and un un unrealizable demands <laughs> on mineral resources. Um, and secondly, the, secondly, the, there is no climate crisis so, that is the wrong reason altogether for taking action of any kind of energy, simply because there, there is no climate crisis. So, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of moralistic grandstanding about saving the planet, but the, the planet isn't in crisis. So it's whatever is being done it is being done for the wrong reason. So. You know, I think in terms of changing the paradigm, 
that paradigm needs to be changed. We need to, uh, to start talking about doing things for the right reason, not for the wrong reason. Donald, because sorry. it's not going to work. Yes. Donald, there's a huge propaganda by very powerful people to suppress the right paradigm, as Jim has already said. And it's not a matter of reason. It's a matter of now a political battle know, yeah. on a massive scale. Sure. Against the global elite that is out to crush us. That is the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we've, we've, come mm-hmm. to, we've come to terms with that one, Harinder. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> that is a challenge. All right. So we have time for one last question. And uh, Leon has been waiting for a while. So Leon, uh, go for it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, thank you, Jim, for a very, uh, very clear and comprehensive presentation. Um, I was wondering, I, I, I know a little bit of uh, a little bit about uh, um, marine uh, environmental policies, uh, marine environmental policies. And there's a leading concept in that field that that calls uh, is called the ecosystem approach, you know, and uh, the idea about that is, you know, the, the environment, the marine environment is, is an integrated dynamic system, you know, where many different factors and, and forces are at play. And to manage that environment, including human activities in the environment, you need to take what they then call a holistic approach, yes, uh, taking all this into consideration in, in interaction, let's say. So uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, so a lot of policies for official policies are, are designated around that principle. And and then I'm always very surprised when we then come to the climate the, of the, the very planet itself, then I don't hear anything about taking an ecosystem approach. Uh, but it's like, uh, you know, it's only one isolated factor in isolation, which is then uh, uh, impacting the environment, you know. And um, I sometimes imagine the, the scientists that, that the, the moment that they came to that discovery, that conclusion for them, that it was only one isolated factor which contributed to climate change. This must have been a moment of awe and wonder of these people because it was absolutely one of the, a very unlikely scenario. That must have been the hypothesis at the very end of the line, you know, that it would be only one uh, factor in, in, in isolation, which is causing all this. So uh, I just wonder if you if you hear anything in this whole field of climate change about this ecosystem approach, because it is a very f- official term in policies of the UN and, and on other bodies. So, yeah, ecosystem approach and climate change. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, Unfortunately, when uh, the IPCC or the UNFCCC, as it's called, was founded back in 1988, they were given the brief to investigate human-caused climate change. That was a gross mistake. Absolutely wrong. They should have uh, encompassed all causes of climate change. And that would bring in the ecosystem concept that you speak about and would have been far more uh, to the point where they'd investigate solar and, and all the natural influences of El Nino, La Nina, underground volcanoes, everything, the sun, bring it all in together and, and let's be reasonable. But that's, they got the wrong steer and I, maybe it was probably deliberate. Um, some, somebody pushed it in there, human caused. Mm. And uh, you know that goes back and, and unfortunately, uh, IPCC itself has taken that to extremes. I mean, they 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 should, of course, have investigated all causes um, and broadened the study of of all of their assessment reports. And I agree fully with you that would be mm-hmm. an ecosystem approach, which would be far more logical and lead to much uh, more uh, sane solutions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I was going to ask you that indeed that this uh, that the IPCC that is what I read somewhere that that you know they gather all the research right in the whole climate field, but and and so they come to their conclusion of what is the co- the consensus in science. But I have understood, and I think you just confirmed that 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 the principle for the research that they gather is all the research which points to human causes in climate change. Yes, is, is that, this is correct? It's a, yeah, it has become yeah. a, an embedded groupthink that it is CO2 related. 
and yeah. you know that's been more and more and and uh, enforced uh, internally and and more and more exaggerated and and that's why it has led now to this AR6 report being totally exaggerated and biased and and really uh, is pointing uh, a lot of people are saying, and we'd say it too, that IPCC now must be fundamentally reformed or disbanded. It really has come to that. Mm. May I ask a quick uh, follow-up question there? Is that time? Yes. About about this extreme weather element, uh, that uh, I, I always find that uh, very, uh, yeah, also quite amazing. So. So they, they come up with yeah uh, climate change is causing extreme more extreme weather and uh, so uh, hurricanes and storms and everything and and for me I, I can understand why you would come up with that image because it gives kind of an image of of the earth being all you know destabilized and enraged and it is kind of already starting to explode from from within basically that's kind of the image you know of the the, the angry god basically you know from from what uh, what we are causing uh, all here so so that's kind of this uh, so i can see how that image is powerful but is there any 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 i i cannot imagine that you can scientifically demonstrate a link between climate change and, and extreme weather and couldn't but a very simple uh, thought that i had myself is it not just as um just as as possible that climate change would lead to more calm weather or tempered weather, you know? And I can imagine that's a less attractive uh, image, you know, oh, everything becomes more calm and everything. But uh, yeah, this link between between this, this climate change, which is which is over more generations, I always understood, and, and just incidental extreme weather. I cannot see that there would be a, a sound scientific basis to, to, to demonstrate that link. No. Correct. Uh, I mean, as I pointed out, that that in past periods of history, the climate was extremely uh, violent and extreme and cold and and, and hot and all kinds of um, storms, tornadoes and all the rest of it. Um, and it's because the Earth is a, a system of, of random uh, events in the, that we don't understand in the in the atmosphere, in the sea, and on, in the center of the earth, and in the various external factors, the sun and the other planets influencing. So it is naturally and randomly uh, subject to all of these forces. Um, the, there are a couple of things, for example, a warmer, slightly warmer climate can mean that more, uh, more rain, more moisture is held in, in the air and you can get more extreme rainfalls. Or if the the uh, climate is a, a bit warmer, then naturally you can have more drying out and be more subject possibly to, to more forest fires. But they are quite remote things. And even, as I said, IPCC itself in its detailed report finds no um, statistical increase in the number of extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. uh, that is remarkable. But of course, they don't give that impression and, and the the summary for policymakers produced by IPCC, the synthesis report that recently came out, that is a report by politicians for politicians. It is not a scientific report. And, and that is the sad thing about IPCC. It has become so politicized, so biased, and in trying to perpetu perpetuate the, the, the climate catastrophe myth that it really has lost, unfortunately, objective climate science. Hmm. All right, thanks. Thank you. Jim, you mentioned uh, that there is a, uh, a regular meeting group that you um, organize that people could also participate in to continue their education, scientific education process with the ICSF. Um, is that something yeah. that you'd like to tell people how they could register for that and participate? Yeah, um, in fact, uh, we have uh, had lectures over or five years, but in the last years since COVID happened, we basically had to go online and that was a blessing in disguise. Um, and we now record all of those uh, presentations and you'll find about 20 of them on our website, icsf.ie, i.e. being for Ireland. So uh, icsf.ie, 
you'll find um, uh, presentations by the world's top independent scientists. And my lecture, in fact, was based on extracts from many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have built up therein probably one of the best um, collections of, of real independent science uh, lectures. Um, it so happens that we have, we're continuing that series and our next lecture is on May 24th. And we would be delighted. Uh, we'll share uh, the link with you, Matt, and you are welcome to disseminate that amongst all of the group here. Um, and you will be very welcome. In fact, Donal is the person who does the communications for us. So you'll be most welcome to join uh, our lectures, which are actually at 7 p.m. our time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Wednesdays usually, and the next one is on May 24th. So we will distribute uh, that invitation to you and keep you, and, and people can, if they want, email us directly so that we get their email on our mailing list uh, every time. Um, the, the other thing I can do is that uh, there are two similar groups to ICSF, in Canada, one for the French speaking, one for the English speaking region. I'll share those names with you and, and people locally in Canada can link up with them uh, and if they wish, that is entirely open. I'm sure they'll be welcomed um, uh, on again, uh, increasing knowledge of, of realistic and, and objective climate science. So delighted to do that and delighted <laughs> to have new disciples uh, coming into our lecture series. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, and what I'll be sure to do as soon as this uh, video is, is made available online, we'll have all of those links to your website and, and all of the information to reach out to you on the uh, in the description box of the video. Um, so yep. hopefully that will increase uh, the pollination of these ideas. And uh, it was not lost on me that today is, is Mother's Day. And I think that uh, you have done one of the, the best You've given one of the best gifts to Mother Nature that she could possibly have hoped for by uh, removing the the mantle of the usurper, the 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 Gaia cult and Earth Mother Gaia, and, and moving it back to actual Mother Nature, which loves truth and not the uh, the weird cultist uh, freaks who would like to sabotage human development in favor of some weird uh, scenario from pagan Rome that they want to revive under a, a pseudoscientific veneer. So I think that this is great. This is a really great Mother's Day celebration. And uh, thank you everybody for, for sharing this with us. And thank you, Jim. And thank you for the rest of Jim's Irish scientist crew. I, I was really happy that we had the full, the full gang here today. That was really good. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. thank you. Take care. Yeah, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.